about the three kinds of fiber yesterday. Animal, plant, and insect. We are spinning an animal fleece and the name of the animal is the alpaca. And it is related to llamas, vicuñas, and guanaco. And they're related to camels, but they're from South America. They have a lot of fiber. So a little recap. People spin fiber that lives near them. So in the Middle East they spin camel fiber because they have access to it. In the Andes Mountains, they spin llama and alpaca because they have access to it. In um, Kashmir, they spin goat fiber because they have access to it. That's kind of how it works. And it works the same way with plants. The most common plant fiber that we're all wearing probably right now is cotton. And then the most common insect fiber would be silk. And researchers are trying to figure out how to use spider webs because they're very thin and very fragile and very, I'm sorry, very thin and very flexible and they don't break very easily. So they're kind of a promising new fiber, but they're still researching it. So what I did before class today was I spun some alpaca on this spindle and I spun some alpaca on this spindle down here. Now I'm taking a shortcut because I didn't have several hours to spin today. Normally I would fill my spindle all the way up. This certainly will work for our demonstration, but I'm just trying to teach you how it would be if I was spinning to make yarn to knit with, okay? This part of my spinning wheel, believe it or not, is called a Lazy Kate. And when I ply my yarn, I turn the Lazy Kate around. And what I'm going to do today is spin two yarns together, that's called plying, to make my yarn stronger. Most yarn that you purchase is not single ply, and most yarn that you purchase, of course, if you tuned in yesterday, is not spun with a spinning wheel like this. This yarn illustrates ply very well. You can see that it's two colors. That's because the white is the natural color of that alpaca and the light brown is a different fleece from a different animal and I plied them together and now it's stronger and more durable and easier to knit with or weave with because I did that. Almost all the yarn you're ever going to use is at least two ply. So what I'm going to do now is take these two yarns and ply them together, and then I'll show you how my skein winder works, how we get them off the spinning wheel, okay? So, as I said yesterday, if yarn, if fiber is not organized, it's almost useless. It's very hard to use fiber that hasn't been turned into yarn. And yarn is simply organized fiber. That's really all it is. So, I'm going to take this here, put it through this eye right here, and yesterday we explained how the spinning wheel works. If you want to learn that and you're just tuning in today, look at yesterday's lesson. We also showed you an old spinning wheel yesterday that my great-grandfather made, which looks more typical. The spinning wheel I have here is not a very typical spinning wheel. It's an unusual one in this country. But I like it because it's portable, it's easy to bring into school, and it's, it's a fast spinning wheel. Okay, now I just realized my yarn's a little short, so this might not work very quickly, but well, I'll be patient. When you ply, you turn this wheel the other direction, okay? So yesterday when I was spinning, my wheel went clockwise. For plying, it has to go counterclockwise. If it doesn't, what happens is you unspin your yarn by accident. 
Okay? So this is all you do is you take these two pretty thin yarns and I am plying them together with my spinning wheel going counterclockwise to make a single stronger yarn. But it won't look like the brown and white two ply I showed you because they're both white. Okay? And now, one question I get when I spin it at school instead of doing art at home, kids always want to know why is there a hole in this big wheel. That's because then it's easier to spin. If it was a solid block of wood, it would be much harder on my leg, my right leg, the leg that's pumping the treadle. When I spin a lot, I get like a treadle muscle down the front of my shin, which is kind of funny because I'm using my shin in a way I don't normally use it, unless I'm spinning. So you just keep doing this until your spindle is full, okay? And then when your spindle is full, you need to take your yarn off of your spindle. That's where the skein winder comes in. Let me get a little more on here. The reason I'm moving my yarn and my hooks is to fill up the spindle evenly. I don't want a big ball here and then hardly any other yarn anywhere else. Once yarn gets tangled, it can be very difficult to untangle and very time consuming. So that's the whole point of moving your yarn through your hooks up and down your spindle to keep it organized. Okay? And now, I don't want this to get too long and I don't want you to get bored. Now we're going to do a massive shortcut. Are you ready? Really big shortcut. So, we are going to pretend that this spindle is full of two-ply yarn. Okay? Now, we need to take this yarn off in a way that we can wash the yarn and clean the yarn and dry the yarn and then use the yarn. And after you do all those things, before you use it is when you dye it if you want it to be different colors. And I'm not going to demonstrate that today because there isn't a way that I can do that that doesn't take a long, 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 long time. But I will explain it with words. You can make dye, D-Y-E. It doesn't mean not alive. It's a, it sounds the same as D-I-E, but it has a totally different meaning. You can make dye out of plants. You can make it out of Kool-Aid. You can make it out of dye that you purchase from the store. I tend to use either Kool-Aid or plants. But if this was not a demonstration, if I was doing this to make yarn for myself, this whole skein would be filled now. Then you take this off and you wash it carefully and then you hang it over a dowel like this to dry with some weights on the bottom. It dries overnight and then you add your dye. Okay? And if, let's say you want to make yellow yarn, you could take dandelion, dandelions or marigold petals and cook them in water with some vinegar to cause your dye to set. And then when the dye absorbs into the yarn, then it's done. And then you let it dry, and then you can use it. So now let's focus on some finger knitting again. Yesterday we learned with one finger. Today we're going to learn with more than one. So you start out with a loop again. Any way you make your loop is fine. It doesn't matter. Put it on your finger. I'm right-handed, so I'm going to put it on my left hand. And then you do this, and then you do wrap, over, off, wrap, over, off, wrap, over, off, wrap, over, off, wrap, over, off. It's the same. And it makes the same thing as the single finger, but it's just wider. That's all. And you do each finger twice in a row so that you're always doing two. Otherwise you're going to go down to one finger and your finger knitting will be thinner. 
Okay. And now I'm going to show you how to do a wider one with more fingers. If you want to end so that it doesn't fall apart, this step is important. You take this end of your yarn through this loop and this loop. And now it won't fall apart. So you can see this is wider than yesterday's single finger. See that? It's wider. Okay, now I'm going to skip to four fingers because uh, three would be the exact same. You just use one less finger. You do your loop. This is the part that kids always have a hard time with at school. So if you need a grown up to help you, get them to help you with the loop. You put it on your finger. You go over this finger, under this finger, over this finger. Then you come back under, over, under. Then you do wrap over off, wrap over off, same, exactly the same. And it doesn't matter if you start by going under this finger with the yarn or over. Either one, it doesn't matter as long as the next one is the opposite. So if you start under, your next one's over. If you start over, your next one's under. It doesn't matter. The point is you weave the yarn through your fingers so that you can do the wrap over off. And your end finger you do twice in a row. Otherwise you're not always doing four. And then your yarn, will, your finger knitting will gradually get thinner. These can make even scarves or belts because they're wider. And if you want to do it with five, you can start on your thumb and do it with five. Then it's even a tiny bit wider than this. So now I'm going to show you how to end again. And here we go. We cut it. Oh, that's already cut. I didn't even know that. So I'm going to take my end, put it through this loop, put it through this loop, put it through this loop, and this loop. And now it can't unravel. And you can see the difference in the widths. Let me show you. This is four fingers. This is two. And this is one. Okay? So there you go. You learned a little bit more about spinning. You learned a little, another way to finger knit. I hope you're enjoying our fiber unit. And miss you guys. Bye-bye.